Wes, did you see that the Fedora 31 beta came out today? Oh, no. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. I'm already jonesing for it. But I was looking at it. Something in there has me a little nervous. They're switching from C groups 1 to C groups 2. Upgrade. Don't really understand what that means. And one of the things they say in there is, if your tool expects C groups 1, it may break. And I'm, I'm thinking like, well... What tool is that? Is that one of my tools? I don't know. You're going to have to read the docs, Chris. I'm already looking forward to it, though. I got the itch. I I got up this morning, and my laptop was like, hey, can we upgrade? And I'm like, no, laptop, it's a beta. You know how it does that? Right. So then I'm moving along, and it's like, hey, Chris. I'm like, what laptop? And it's like, I'd like to do an upgrade to Fedora 31. It's got that new GNOME shell. I'm like, no, the beta just came out today, laptop. Stop it. You know, it's (laughs) like my kids. Yeah. And then I get to the studio today. It's like, hey, Chris. Hey, Chris, you got fast internet here. You could do the update. You won't leave me alone, Wes. You know, I'm honestly very impressed you've made it this far. I don't want to do the beta. I don't want to run a beta, but my laptop won't shut up about it. Is this what I'm going to find out you installed the beta on on one of our production machines already? On your machine. What? Hello there, and welcome into Linux Unplugged, episode 319. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hello, Wes. Hello. Big show today. Huge show. We have not one, but two guests joining us today to explain various things that need explained. And of course, we have some big community news to get into, as well as some new releases of one of our favorite tools. Oh, boy. That's right. That's right. And some other community events to share with you, as well as some picks. We got, well, you could say like a whole rack of a show. Like a, It's not like a half rack of a show. Big rack, yeah. Yeah, full it's a full power. rack. Yeah. So to, to really help us dig into all of this, we really got to say hello over there to Mr. Cheese and Mr. Alex. Hey, guys. Well, hello, guys. Buongiorno. Hey, make yourself comfortable. Make sure you grab yourself a cup of water there. Wes brought in water for everybody. Of course. And uh, thanks for joining us. And, it's sparkling, uh, by the way, sparkling. Oh, really? Nice, Wes. You know, everybody's going to have the burps now, though. Oh, whoops. <laughs> and also, time-appropriate greetings to that mumble room. Hello, virtual lug. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. 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 Uh, I'm noticing uh, we had not only have a nice showing there in the main mumble room, but we got a good uh, showing there in the quiet listening, the low latency listening, as yeah. we call it, there in the mumble room. Yeah, I think it's like one of the low, best low latency, low bandwidth it, ways to listen to the it's show. It's like you're right here in studio with us, basically. You do get a special studio mix. And we're glad to see you there. That's true. It's true. Well, let's start things off with some community news that uh, I'm honestly a little shocked to start with. Uh, Today, as we record, it's been announced that Richard Stallman has resigned as president and director of the Free Software Foundation and from the MIT CSAIL, is that how we say it? CSAIL department over his comments related to Jeffrey Epstein. Huge. Uh, First, uh, in order of events, I saw the announcement about MIT and then... I saw the announcement directly from the Free Software Foundation. They write, on September 16th, 2019, Richard M. Stallman, the founder and president of the Free Software Foundation, resigned as president and from its board of directors. The board will be conducting a search for the new president beginning immediately. You can find more details on fsf.org when they know more. This is huge. Um, And it's been also something of a bit of a fascination of mine to watch the mainstream media begin to report report this story. Right. It's connected to a huge scandal now. Um, And they refer to him as computer scientist and open software advocate. Oh, boy. Wow. (sighs) He has resigned. Um, The the scandal tied to Jeffrey Epstein is related to uh, $7.5 million in donations that he gave to the MIT Media Lab, which was far more than what was previously disclosed than the group inside MIT was discussing this issue when Richard Stallman made his views about some of the victims clear. Uh, Parts of that quote were then picked up by the media and um, after it was blogged about. And it's it's really kind of over the last few days since we recorded, it's turned into quite a firestorm. Absolutely. Kind of blew up, right? And we got insight into what seemed like indefensible remarks. And Stallman has a long, a long history, kind of brought that back to light too. One of the things that I saw was a, it was a, a new group of individuals that were learning about his views on certain topics that didn't previously know about that. Some of us, you know, we, we've, we've gone to his website over the last decade plus. We, we know what his views are on some of these things and have considered it to be a little gross for a while. But a new round of individuals over this last weekend, really, you know, kind of starting in the middle of last week, discovered some of these things. Um, but I think, you know, what, what I, I believe is important to take here from all of this is 
we shouldn't frame the conversation as a reaction to comments that Richard Stallman made about Jeffrey Epstein's victims. This is really the end result of a pattern of behavior over decades that has eventually led to some kind of response. I think we all kind of knew this was likely coming for Richard Stallman. Yeah, Those I of mean, us that have followed this for a while. Right. And, and I think you're right. At least in the wider community, he's mostly known for his, you know, fairly extreme philosophies and, and ideas about free software, at least viewed that way by, by many. But there is this, this undercurrent, and if you've been paying attention, this has always been there. Yeah, you, you followed this uh, pretty closely for Linux headlines, and there was a moment where it seemed like something was going to have to give pretty soon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, over the weekend, both the, you know, the, the Software Freedom Conservancy made a statement saying that basically Richard Stallman shouldn't, shouldn't have this position anymore. And then the executive director of the Gnome Foundation said that in, in his view, the foundations could no longer have a, have a formal relationship if Richard Stallman was still there. Wow. Yeah. Um, they write, we admire the work that the Free Software Foundation staffers and volunteers have done, but we have reached a point concluding that the greatest service to the mission of free software is for Richard to step down from the SFF. And if this doesn't happen, then they'll look at, they, as they write, severing the historical ties between GNOME, GNU, and the Free Software Foundation. And that would be the only path forward. Wow. Like that was, I mean, something had to break here. Yeah, absolutely. And I, when I saw this happen, because this was before Richard Stallman's announcements, I thought to myself, the FSF is going to go down with Stallman. The two are inseparable. They are linked. Right. You I can't mean, have he, one he, without the other. They, that certainly has seemed that way for, for years. I was really shocked when I saw this, but, you know, I think um, it's not super surprising. Richard Stallman probably wants to take uh, whatever actions he thinks are best for the longevity of the foundation. And it's probably better for the community as a whole if we don't have someone with this history representing us. So uh, I think Rich, I think Richard Stallman probably knew that this was the best move he had to make. There's a famous quote of Richard Stallman's that I shared with the team when the, when the news was announced. And I, I kind of feel like it's appropriate to read it here on the show because it's, it's like one of those prescient quotes from the man himself right. where, you know, like there's that meme that Richard Stallman was right. Well, he, there, he even has a quote that sort of summarizes this. Geeks like to think that they can ignore politics. You can leave politics alone, but politics won't leave you alone. He's right. Absolutely and that's is. exactly what happened here. I'm definitely uh, along the same lines as you, as far as it's been a discovery, uh, a week of discovery for a lot of people where we knew after reading his blog, you know, th there are questionable things in his blog. I always had kind of a weird feeling about the guy myself, but uh, what he's done for the Free Software Foundation and that movement has gotten it to where it is today. I'm glad that he is willing to just step down and let the Free Software Foundation continue with, with you know, quite frankly, better leadership. All right. Well, moving on then, let's talk about something that's pretty exciting for owners of the Raspberry Pi. There is a first fully functional 64-bit OS for the Raspberry Pi 4, because right Ooh. now it's 32-bit only, right, even yeah. though it's a 64-bit device. But who it's from is a bit of a surprise, Wes. Uh, yeah, it's uh, our friends over at Bellina. Now, yeah. if you, if you don't Etcher, right? Yeah, the Etcher people. Yeah. That, yeah, but turns out they do a lot more than that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's very true. I mean, okay, so if you don't remember, Bellina OS is an open source, minimal, Yocto Linux-based host operating system that's designed for containers. Um, it enables a fast and modern workflow for many different embedded device types and now includes the Raspberry Pi 4. Basically, they've got a system in place to take modern workflows that you might be used to on the server, you know, building a new container image, pushing that up to test, and then eventually into production, and make that work on embedded and IoT applications. So now you can get the 64-bit goodness and run side-by-side 32-bit -side and 64-bit Docker containers on your Pi. I, I kind of like this because I'm using the Pi exclusively right now to run Docker containers. Right. And I did kind of pine about not having a <laughs> pine about having a 64-bit OS when I was loading it up to do server stuff. And one of the things I didn't fully appreciate when I bought the Raspberry Pi 4 is I was buying a, a machine to run Raspbian. 
and pretty much only Raspbian. When you look at some of the things that they had to overcome to even make this thing possible, it's clear that it's going to take a a long time before most distros are supporting the Raspberry Pi 4. Right, yeah, I mean, like, basically, there's been a lot of hardware changes, and you're trying to move over to 64-bit, so... They had to improve stuff in Yocto for the board support package changes, which is all that stuff for the fun ARM platform, and work with their bootloader. Yeah, the bootloader, the way you initialize the graphics, the way you initialize the PCI bus, all weird and different. <laughs> it's all different Just on the Just how it works, works right? Uh, so I'll be running Raspbian for a while, I think. However, you and I very momentarily did get CentOS running on the Raspberry Pi Yes, 4. we did. That was fun. <laughs> that was fun. We had to get it working um, on a Raspberry Pi 3 first, right? Isn't that what we did? And then we patched the kernel on the SD card and then booted it on the Raspberry Pi 4. Thankfully, some kind of community member out there had built an updated version, but that was, that was how, what you had That's to do before. That's what they did. Yep. Right. Right, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of awesome, though, to have CentOS on a Pi 4, but it was 32-bit as well. Uh, so, uh, Bellina OS. You know, it is neat to just see because they're leveraging, you know, open source distributions and a bunch of the, like, open source Mobi-based tooling for Docker to build their customized platform. Yeah. Let's talk about NextCloud. NextCloud 17 is out, and there's some pretty nice features in here. The one that really jumps out to me is Remote Wipe. All right, so if you permit downloading of documents by a third party... You can now wipe the documents from the devices after you're done collaborating. So maybe you have a few sensitive things. You want someone to you know, assess a pre-release of something, and they don't need access afterwards. NextCloud can make it happen. It is a little creepy, though, right? I yeah. mean, once I download something, I kind of want to keep it. Yeah, I, I don't see how it could work without either a NextCloud client installed or you go back to the website, and next time you revisit, somehow it could remove those files. But I don't. I think it's got to be tied into the client, right? So it's only of certain probably usefulness. However, definitely had a scenario one time where a client had Dropbox, where it was one of those random implementations where the staff just started using it to share files around. Yes. And then they worked with a contractor who took off and took off with the folder on their hard drive. Yeah, I mean, really, like, that's the story here. This is an enterprise-friendly feature and might yeah, make yeah. it easier for some people to adopt it. Yeah. They've also been trying to make uh, a bit of a showcase out of some of their larger government uh, installations and better support for two-factor authentication. Now, during the initial sign-up and login process, a user can set up two-factor authentication and more services than ever are supported these days. There's gateways that use SMS. Of course, you have your standard one-time password services for like Google Authenticator or similar apps. So they're really all in on the two-factor authentication nice. now with this release. That's good to see. It does look nice because we're using NextCloud right. these days. Guess that means it's time to update, Wes. I think it is. It's time to update. Well, let's take a moment and talk about something a little different. So in our community is an individual who's an advocate for PowerShell. DM is active in several communities, and he's uh, also the individual behind the PowerShell on Linux website and Twitter account. And I love his story, and I wanted to share it with you, and why he thinks PowerShell, which I, which is a topic that just like, what? PowerShell? Linux? Right. I mean, we've talked about Bash it. Bash is perfectly fine. We talked about it when it came to Linux for the first time. We, we knew it was out there, yeah. but I mean, I, I don't use it. Even today, though, I was in a Telegram group where he mentioned using PowerShell, and somebody's like, blasphemy! Um, but like so many tools, at a necessity, you discover something's quite useful. Uh, it, like in DM's case, he's a very clever individual, and he manages a lot of boxes. I manage over 20,000 VMs. Yeah, Woo. that's a lot of VMs. And so saving time is extremely important. And there's an element to this that I can really fundamentally appreciate. But I think maybe we start with PowerShell itself. PowerShell is a bit of a different beast, isn't it? It's not, it's not like Bash. No, I mean, it doesn't. It comes from a different heritage, right? It's, it's not really a, a Unix tool. It comes from the Windows world. Mm. And you get to leverage a lot of the .NET platform. So instead of, you know, throwing text around, you've got objects. Yeah. For me, I like Bash, and don't get me wrong, but because it's, it's very text-based, it's the good thing about it, and it's also the worst thing about it for me. Because, because if you have to work with text, it's, and you need to figure out like, uh, all these, uh, you know, special commands. And, and because PowerShell is, is just like Python is object oriented, you could do amazing, simple things so easily in like one command. That seems to be the core difference, object oriented versus text. 
That seems pretty key to using PowerShell. Well, yeah, right. I mean, so imagine you have, um, you've got a date and you want to go grab like just the month part of that. Well, you could probably whip up something to split by whatever separator you're using and then grab the middle field or something. But if you've got objects, well, there's, there's probably just a method that you call to get the month out of it, right? Uh-huh. So it's, it's more structured than text. Now, there's an aspect to it that I can completely appreciate as well as somebody who was a desktop Linux user managing Windows systems and having to deal with user account changes and other things that just desperately, desperately need to be automated and trying to come up with a solution and even some means to automate them across platforms. Creating an Active Directory user used to take 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, because of all this special stuff, like this all special configuration and using PowerShell, I, I, I kept saying like we, we would hire 30 people and then they wouldn't pass their, you know, uh, insurance uh, selling exam and then we would fire half of them. And then I would just spend <laughs> hours creating these accounts and then deleting them, which was crazy. So then I, that's pretty much how I started with PowerShell. I was like, I'm not going to spend hours uh, this is like it's funny. There it's has all, to be a better way. That is how it always goes, isn't it? <laughs> it's a necessity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's not all just for managing Microsoft systems. It's not all just about making sure you can create Active Directory users. There's a big community out there. The other day, I found out there's a FreeNAS module for PowerShell. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Really? So now, all of a sudden, you know, oh, I have this this uh, FreeNAS box that I use for, you know, like my home lab and whatnot. So all of a sudden I'm like, ah, I want to create a new volume. Then I use, I import this, I download this module, I import it, and then I have like connect FreeNAS server or something. I give it the name of the server, the credentials, and poof, I'm connected. And then I I have other simple commands like, uh, I don't know, new volume or whatever, new FreeNAS volume. I don't remember the exact command. Right, but then you can start scripting your own little environments and handy helpers. And Yeah, exactly. So then, you know, I, I, so you start with at home and then all of a sudden you take it, it, and uh, because the API is very similar between FreeNAS and TrueNAS, you can, you can use the same, I think the same library supports TrueNAS. And then you take it to work and then, uh, at my job, I have to administer, uh, a bunch of uh, different, uh, storage systems. So uh, we have, uh, because uh, the application we build integrates with different uh, SAN providers and stuff like that. So um, I have to administer NetApps and Isilon and all kinds of weird, like FreeNAS, uh, FreeNAS is not weird, but other weird storage vendors. So if they have uh, PowerShell support, then all of a sudden, it, from my Linux box, it's really easy for me to man- to, to automate the deployment of all this stuff. Because I have one, kind of like this one uh, interface, which is PowerShell, and I have all these different modules. One of the things that seems like it's a key differentiator is that PowerShell has these modules. Yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of built right in. In Bash, you might automate things by installing additional programs, right? And then sort of tying those together. But PowerShell is more like a, like a programming language in the sense that you've, you've got these community modules you can go find and use. So whether it's FreeNAS, FreeNAS. or um, I know DM was talking about a Selenium driver. So if you want to go do a bunch of like automating websites that don't have APIs, well, you can do that with PowerShell too. Yeah. Not everything is golden though. Not everything is, is you know, golden. For example, a lot of... Uh, um, the Active Directory modules don't work on Linux yet. I took it upon myself. I keep I keep talking to different people from Microsoft, from all kinds of places. Like, oh, I have this module. Can you test it on Linux? So I downloaded it in my box, and then uh, um, um, I think one of the Azure SQL team member on Microsoft. Uh, they have an official SQL server uh, module. So he said, hey, can you, it works on core, it should work on Linux. I already know that's not true because sometimes there's all kinds of little things that make it break. So I downloaded the module, I try to import it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because there's, uh, you know, Linux uh, file system is case sensitive and Windows is not. So then all of a sudden this file has a lower case letter in it, boom, it doesn't break. So then uh, I created a PR and I said, uh, not a PR, an issue in their system and I'm trying to fix it. DM makes the case that the more users on Linux, uh, the more priority it becomes for Microsoft. And what's also great about this, and this is something I really connected with him on, is it means fundamentally 
more people can run Linux on the desktop. I'm trying to make the um, the PowerShell experience on Linux much better, so then more people won't have to go to Windows to you know to do their the, their day job. And I think that's probably the if Microsoft was trying to extinguish Linux, there's no way they would have open sourced this because it's pretty much the tool that allows you to manage all these Microsoft things without Windows. <laughs> it is really kind of, I, I was thinking like, and we have an extended conversation with DM that'll be out on Jupiter Extras, but I was thinking when I was talking to him, like, I would have killed for this. Yes, right? I mean, you can actually go interact with, leverage a bunch of Windows environments in yeah. a way that's native to them. Yeah. I think we're also made a little uncomfortable because it has this different heritage, right? Like, it comes from Microsoft, it's, it's using Windows tools, but it's an, it's an open source shell on top of an open source kernel, right? Like, what's not to like? And that cat is out of the bag. It's MIT licensed. It's out of the bag. Uh, also of note today, Microsoft open sourced their C++ standard library. Actually, it was technically yesterday. They announced at a community conference that they were releasing their C++, C++ standard library code as open source. The STL code is now up on GitHub and provided under the Apache 2 license. Oh, yeah. Look at them go. More and more open source. <laughs> more and more all the time. They say they hope this move will help developers continue to keep the library compliant in the fast-moving world of C++ standards. And they hope it's a measure of payback to the developer community. Isn't that an interesting statement? The first part's being like, uh, we're not doing a great job keeping up with the standards. Will you, will you guys uh, <laughs> yeah, help us keep this going? It's kind of an admission of that, isn't it? Right. And then the other half is like, but also, like, here, you know, we can all, we can all make this better. You get to have all the code for the other stuff, too. I don't mind that. No, honestly, it kind of makes sense, right? That's part of the open source community and the interaction is we're all going to use the tooling, and if it is open, we can all make it better. Yeah. We have a few items in housekeeping for the episode. Got messy in here. Yeah. You know, I've been traveling. Was it was it in Washington over the the weekend? Just didn't have time, brought in a whole bunch of dirt. I'm sorry about that. So here's a few things we got to take care of. Uh, First and foremost, just a reminder, Texas Cyber Summit coming up real soon now. Texas Cyber Summit, October 10th through the 12th, 2019, at the Grand Hyatt. San Antonio. San Antones. Wes and I'll be there. What? Nick Cheesy, are you going too, Cheesy? Oh, yeah, I'll be there. Honestly, Cheese being there, that's a, that's a reason to go if that's you weren't already thinking about it. Yeah, that's that's definitely enough. Nice. If you are going to be in the area and uh, you don't have a ticket but you would like to go, uh, join our Telegram group. It's t.me forward slash TCS 2019. And uh, you might be able to score a ticket. What is that again? T.me slash what? T.me dot, uh, <laughs> T.me slash TCS 2019. TCS. All right. Very good. Texas Cyber Summit. There's a B new track too, which if you're thinking about getting in the uh, cyber industry, that'd be a good one for you. Right. Don't forget, we also have the uh, Hacky Bir- Hacker Birthday Dinner Meetup. Meetup.com oh. slash broadcasting. It's all there. So also... Can we just take a moment, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a round of applause again. Two new shows launched on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. Very, very, very excited to say we are now into week two of Linux Headlines, linuxheadlines.show. Great show. Oh, man. Wes, you're doing a, you're doing a bang-up job. No, you're Drew doing a bang-up job. No, you are. You're Drew right, though. killed Drew, it on Friday. Drew's kill- Fridays with Drew are my favorite. <sighs> he's, doing, he's so damn good. He's How can he be so new and still that good? I don't know. We'll learn from him, though. I know. So linuxheadlines.show, go check that out. The things you need to know that's going on in Linux and open source in three minutes or less every weekday. Yeah, I said every weekday. I said that. I said that. It's crazy. crazy. Linuxheadlines.show. Also, it's finally here. Self-hosted episode one. The first one is out. Self-hosted.show slash one. Alex and I just get things kicked off in this episode. And then coming up very soon, self-hosted.show Our episode with Wendell. Oh, boy. (laughs) Great chat with Wendell. It's all ready to go. We'll be launching it soon, every fortnight, over at selfhosted.show. So go get episode one now and stick around for episode two with Wendell. We had a great chat. Toured his his, uh, studio, his servers, his workstations. Chat all about it. It's pretty great. So go check that out. Selfhosted.show and linuxheadlines.show. Man, so much going on. Crazy. And before you know it, it's Texas Cyber Summit. Before you even know it, Wes. All right. That's the housekeeping. That's the housekeeping. Nicely done. No, you did great. (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't know. I think we've just come up with a thing. So you and I had a chance last week to talk to Phil, one of the co-founders of Manjaro, after they announced the new formation yeah, of their company. Which was great. Really exciting for them. Uh, and we then thought, well, let's let's have kind of a, like a Manjaro celebration. Let's double down. And let's talk with Bernard, one of the other co-founders, this week, because you and I had checked out the community editions, which is one of the many things that Bernard's involved in, right. as well as a few other things. And just to really kind of recognize the moment for Manjaro, they've moved into a, a new echelon of distributions. There's a, a legal entity behind them. They have a, a community. They've they formed partnerships with commercial organizations. Like They're getting recognition on large YouTube platforms. It's a, it's a big moment. And so we really wanted to take the time to both talk to Phil and Bernard. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hello, sir. So why don't we why don't we start off with, you know, a little bit of news. There's a brand new fresh release of Manjaro that's out just as we record. Uh, what's your favorite thing about the new release? Oh, it was quite busy for all of us because we uh, uh, had to get uh, a lot of different editions going. Of course, the official ones, uh, KDE Plasma, XFC and GNOME. And um, I'm uh, also in charge of some of the community editions. So uh, I was doing i3 and uh, Cinnamon and they're all rolling now. Uh, so yes, we have the 18.1.0 release. Of course, it's just a snapshot, not a real, I mean, it's not a real thing with a rolling release, but of course we, we polish everything with the install media and so that the installer works and stuff with some new additions, of course, uh, with the, the new flatback and snaps support with Bau, our new, uh, tool. And, uh, also Calamaris had a recent update and, uh, we also offered a new office suite chooser. So I want to talk about the community edition stuff here in a moment, but we got to do like the human stuff up front. Um, so you got a new job. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, it's basically the job I've been doing for five years already, but now it's a job. Uh, I just used to be in a, like kind of an oversized hobby for me. Uh, I was uh, doing other stuff. I was in the music business as a singer, and uh, but my hobby was taking a lot of time, and so this is finally what I can now concentrate on. Congratulations! Um, you mentioned it as an aside there, but uh, you're you're a bit of a, a known musician. You you uh, we did a little googling, Bernard. You have a bit of an <laughs> online presence when it comes to music. Show research, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, that's true. Yes, I've been quite active. <laughs> How did you end up, um, you know, being also pretty prominent here in the open source community? Oh, well, I was just, uh, I always liked tweaking and uh, analyzing stuff and breaking stuff and putting it uh, again together. I, I actually started out with uh, Atari when it was still a thing. And uh, so I found quite a, found myself quite at home with Linux uh, in between, I was, of, of course, using Windows for everything I needed. And then uh, my main uh, stoppers to switch over to Linux were uh, especially the music uh, software, like uh, music editing, uh, I mean, printed music editing and this kind of stuff. And, uh, but during the recent years, uh, we now have really software for everything I need. So it was finally my opportunity to switch over to Linux. So you come from a creative angle on all of this. Yeah, you could say that. It seems that that has also manifested in your, you're one of the, uh, probably, I guess you're probably one of the prominent supporters of the different community editions. Um, you know, I, I had an opportunity to chat with you off air about the i3 and Cinnamon editions, which I think you're the direct maintainer of. So let's talk a little bit about that. Is that a creative expression for you as well? Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I've styled the desktops. I mean, i3 is a good example because, uh, the way it comes from, uh, from just the packages, it's just totally naked and ugly and, uh, difficult to use. And so it, uh, it took quite a lot of uh, creativity also and, uh, tweaking and also about the optics and theming, uh, is also a, a topic in, in all of our editions, of course. And, so I took over Cinnamon and uh, i3 was kind of abandoned a few years ago. And so that was really a good opportunity for me to, yeah, also express my 
my my kind of my taste and uh, i like things to look nice and uh, to be uh, also accessible and uh, and also pretty on the surface can you um maybe go into a little more about what's different about community editions i mean you know you're involved and you're part of the, the core project so h- how does that differ from one of your major releases yeah, basically in uh, the traditionally in the, in the manjaro community it was like we had uh, it used to be open box originally, where the the core team like was uh, maintaining a main edition, and then we had XFC and KD came after that, and then GNOME is, is more a recent edition, and uh, the community editions were mostly just done by one person. So if you found a, a desktop environment that you would like, and then you would like offer it on the forum. And uh, if you were the first one who presented an, uh, a desktop uh, edition, then it was just your edition. And uh, yeah, it has also grown, I would say. And uh, nowadays, it's, uh, it's like also the community editions are maintained by members of the core team. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I look at uh, the Cinnamon Edition and the i3 Edition specifically, and I think they seem like passion projects to me. But I do kind of want to, I want to kind of examine that uh, question that Wes had there just a little bit further. Um, so I, I kind of, when I picture the Manjaro project, I, I picture a default XFCE desktop. But we were just chatting recently, and it seems, depending on the time of month or day, there's other editions like the Plasma edition that may actually be more popular. Manjaro isn't necessarily defined by a single desktop. So it, I guess, you know, Bernard, in, in your opinion, what defines Manjaro, especially for people that are listening that maybe don't use it, what defines it apart from Arch? One important point is the usability, right? I mean, uh, i3 is a good example because, as I already said, it's a di- very hard to use as it comes originally. And uh, so I've really tried to make it more accessible to to make it uh, look pretty and run right out of the box uh, with everything available, all the shortcuts uh, organized and with a little introduction. And uh, I mean, Manjaro is, is mostly about the core system. And uh, uh, as you can see, it's it's a huge variety of just different desktops on top. So the the team, everybody together, makes sure that the the core system runs well and that uh, the system is is reliable. And then uh, it's just a question of putting any desktop on top, basically. And uh, over the years, we have like also developed our our typical style. It was also. Uh, we decided that it would be good that when you open up a desktop uh, on the first site, you would be able to see, oh, yes, this is a Manjaro edition. So it's like the colors, it's uh, the, the, the fonts. So there is some branding element. Yeah, you could say that. It's not actually the same themes. Yeah, because they, they don't uh, uh, necessarily work on every desktop. But then we, we try to find kind of matching colors and common wallpapers and that kind of stuff. Ah. So do you feel like it would be a fair assessment to say the difference from Arch is the brand, the community, and the intention that you put into the desktop? And you can apply that to i3, Cinnamon, XFCE, or Plasma, because what, what defines Manjaro isn't a desktop environment. The mentality of presenting a desktop ready to go, I would say. I mean, Arch people are really keen on building everything and styling everything the way everybody likes it personally. And we offer like one version that you could just start using on an everyday basis. And uh, uh, if you can live with how it looks like, then you can just, you, you would never have to change anything. And uh, also, we we put together a combination of packages. Like you have uh, 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 an image viewer, you have a, a music player, you have an office suite, you have a mail program, a browser, so that you have everything that you would normally need. So my question is: Now that things are changing a little bit, you know, it's becoming a real business. Uh, it's a it's a full time gig for you. Will there be some 
some shifts in your priorities? You've got a lot on your plate right now, especially with the community edition stuff. Do you see a future where you kind of narrow the list a little bit of what you're involved with? I don't know. I mean, uh, at the moment, we are, we are just starting out and uh, looking around a little bit where our direction is really going. We are like collecting ideas and... Uh, I have the feeling that the team is extremely motivated by our steps and uh, we have a lot of discussions between not not just the two of us, of course, be- uh, between the whole team, which is about uh, something around 12 people or so. And uh, at the moment, it's also about finding out who is uh, who likes to specialize in what and where the strengths of everybody lie. And uh, I don't really think that we need to narrow down our our offer at the moment it's not really what what it's about i mean the the basic idea is to keep what we have running and then to add what uh, what comes up it sort of strikes me that uh manjero is sort of the first to make it this far with something that's based on arch you could look at arch much like ubuntu looks at debian as a great base to build a product on top of and um, you're sort of first to this real estate. You're the first to this new land. What what happens next? I mean, Arch has the, this reputation of being hard to build, hard to use, and hard to maintain. Yeah. And so the, that's somehow where we have grown into, right? We have uh, built our our way of uh, of balancing the the bleeding edge idea with uh, usability and continuity. Of course, it's always, it's still a little bit of a balancing act, but I think we have found our our ground here very well now. So that's probably why we are now in a position where we can really say, okay, this is quite reliable and uh, we can look back on several years now where this has been running smoothly. And, uh, well, one uh, one idea of the of the incorporate of incorporating was also that, uh, as you can see with other projects, that it uh, at a certain point it really gets very hard to do this uh, beside everything else you do as a hobby. It's just you nearly really need to to invest a lot of time, a lot of energy, and to keep it uh, with a certain amount of quality. It was basically our motivation. To, to find a way to really be able to focus on this. I'm pretty excited about it because I think at some point I had just accepted the idea that all of the next big distros that were ever going to happen had happened. And now it was just a matter of, well, let's settle in and figure out how to make this work. And then Manjaro comes along and uh, proved me wrong. And I think it's just, I think it's just so fantastic. I think it's, <laughs> we have absolutely room for more and uh, you guys are really committed to the project and it's getting recognized for what it's contributing and what it, you know, those, those paper cuts that it's solving for end users. And uh, it's just such a great thing to see this next step being taken. And Bernard, I love the community editions. I had a chance to play with Cinnamon and i3 over the weekend. We'll have links in the show notes for those. And I, I just... I love that that's even a thing and that we can have a company where this kind of thing can go on and it can be a creative expression for you and all of that. So thanks for coming on and just answering some of these questions. It's just something I've been considering and I don't know, man, I'm just super happy for you guys. Thanks a lot. Cheesy, you've been running a Manjaro for a little while, haven't you? Yeah. So I've got this uh, Dell Inspirion. It's 3000 series, two in one. Um, it was my wife's old computer. Uh, and, you know, so it just got hand down to me. The first thing I was going to do is load Linux on it. Uh, whenever I tried to load any distro on it, I would have a problem because it's a two-in-one. It has an accelerometer and a gyroscope in it. So by default, um, and this was elementary, pop, fedora, I mean, any distribution that I tried, um, those kernel modules would be enabled by default. So my login screen would be, flipped 180 degrees and and then uh, inverted as if it was in tablet mode and you would be entering information in tablet mode, um, which, you know, is nothing that you can't, with GNOME, you can lock screen rotation now and you can do other things that make it a little bit easier. You can X, R, and R, you know, 
and right. set it back to normal. Uh, you can go back in and blacklist those kernel modules. But the one distro that has worked every single time out of the box, doesn't matter which DEF tried, has been Manjaro. I've never had those kernel modules loaded by default. And for me, I mean, that's a pretty significant thing. You know, that takes three steps out of just getting the machine working properly. Um, and, you know, so I've been using Manjaro off and on on that machine. Just uh, I use it to test other distros, knowing that I'm going to have to rotate the screen. I'm going to have to do a few tweaks, but then inevitably always go back to XFC, uh, the XFC variant of Manjaro on it. And man, I really like it. It's It's been solid. Um, like Bernard said, I love the fact that I still get that rolling release, but I don't have to spend the time to set up Arch. Not mm. that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, if and I've been down that road. I've done that as well, right? But to have a distro out of the box, bleeding edge, um, boom, here you go. Yeah, it helps that they make such nice you know, choices. Like yeah. the defaults are good, so you don't have to change that much. Yeah, it's tastefully done, absolutely. You know, And the fact that they've gone through and they've tried to mimic you know, those themes across all of the uh, DEs and everything. I think they've really done a great job. I haven't tried all of the community editions. I will now, though, knowing that I, I didn't realize that Bernard was putting those together as well. So um, I guess they're official community editions. Ish, yeah. I really love Manjaro too. Uh, I'm a diehard Arch Linux user on the desktop, but my laptop is running Manjaro and the implementation of XFCE that they have is the one that made me realize that XFCE is pretty great. You know, I'm, I'm getting 10 to 12 hours worth of battery life on a T480. Uh, the laptop's cool to the touch. You know, it's it just works, like she said. And it's um, it's more than Arch for people that can't be bothered to install Arch, I think, which <laughs> is what it was always sold as. I look at it a lot, although I try, I'm going to try not to make this comparison, but I look at it in some ways similar to uh, Ubuntu to Debian. Like I could get a decent Debian desktop going if I wanted to spend some time changing all of the defaults and optimizing things a bit. I could, you know, it's it's not much more work really than right. setting up Arch. I mean, it is a, probably a little less, but it's it's kind of equivalent where you, or you could install Ubuntu and you have a pretty ready to go machine. Like that's very much how Ubuntu started. It was a refined selection of good desktop packages with some sane defaults synced to the GNOME release schedule. And so it was a great way to get easy to use Debian. That's what made it so successful right. initially. And that that fundamental recipe is, is kind of what they're applying here to Arch. Well, one thing that I really like too is as an official version, they have the Architect Edition. So if you want to do the same thing you would do with Arch, you can still do that with a Manjaro ISO, which I think is cool that they offer that as an official version as well. Well, congrats to them. Very happy to see them turn this into something they can do sustain sub sustainably. What am I trying to say? Sustainably, yeah, right. I mean, it's yeah, a, it's that. a big deal. Um, Bernard had a successful singing career, and mm -hmm. now he's focusing on this Linux distribution full time. And it's cool that that actually exists. So uh, we have a app pick we want to get to, and we have a headline that uh, we pulled out of Linux headlines to discuss a little bit more here in the show. Uh, so let's do that one first. Just one last thing here from the community news is we've got new kernels, Wes. We've got one that's Ooh. out now. Kernel 5.3 came out this weekend. And oh, that's then always fun. I also kind of want to talk a little bit about 5.4. But in 5.3... They added the ACRN hypervisor, which I was hoping was pronounced Acorn. Acorn. But yeah. I don't think it is. I, I was, why would you not pronounce it Acorn? Why do we need another hypervisor? What's so unique here? Well, okay, so what this this is actually guest support for Linux. So Acorn is a hypervisor that's targeted at embedded and IoT applications, but, ah. but things like real time and safety. So if you've got hmm. things in your car or maybe in like factory managed equipment that you know, people's lives are at stake. Where it could be an embedded device and it uses virtualization to run different OSs on it. Yes, workload part. consolidation, uh -huh. right? You can okay. move lots of things. Existing hypervisors, things that you might use in a data center, not really set up or, or designed with those goals. So this is supposed to be an open source implementation of a, of a reference stack, basically. All managed by the Linux Foundation, of course. This patch set allows Linux to be booted on top of Acorn, so... Hey, that's great. That, that means more places that Linux will run. I, I mean, if you're going to run an OS on your IoT device, I'd rather be Linux. 
Yeah. Right. And I'd rather it be updatable and supported. And if it's baked into the kernel, that means it actually might be possible. Now, this is only bare bones support, so we'll see what happens. There's uh, there's another there's another patch in 5.3 that I thought didn't get enough attention. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, Chris, but sometimes you have a high DPI screen, and then you go and you like boot, you boot Linux, and you can't read it, right? You can't read anything, if, especially what happens if you it doesn't boot up all the way. Right. There's a fix for that now. Yeah. Prefer a bigger font for high resolution screens. That's the name of the commit. And it's, I mean, like, why would you not? Why would you not want that? Everything you need to, you need to know is in the name of the commit. So it uh, it will prefer a console font that is larger on high DPI display, so you can actually read it. Yeah. Now for like 1920 by 1080 and below, nothing changes, no effect. But if you're above that, there's a different font that's used. So that seems like this should have happened ages ago, but. <sighs> As a terminal user, I'm I'm glad. I actually didn't super mind it. Sometimes we get a little janky on how it would update on the screen, but I kind of like fitting more stuff on the screen. You know, I want more screens and I want to fit more on them. Yeah, but I don't always have my microscope right next to my <laughs> That's display. True. Yeah, on the XPS 13, it was kind of ridiculous. It was it was getting pretty bad actually. Well, um, so it's not out yet, but I kind of wanted to talk about something that I thought was interesting about the 5.4 impending Ooh. release. So this next one has a bunch of a bunch of neat stuff. But what I think we're now seeing is you recall just a few weeks ago when the news came out that Microsoft was changing their positioning on XFAT licensing yeah. and said, all right, have at it. You can whip up some XFAT code. You can submit to the kernel. We will not pursue any uh, patent infringement litigation. Great. Hoorah. And then there was this sort of side story about, oh, it turns out somebody created some XFAT right. code. It's not of great quality, but it'll probably make it in the kernel pretty soon. Who could that be? Well, now we got a name on a commit, and that name ties back to Samsung. Samsung. So Samsung whipped this up for their Android devices, likely. Of course. Of substandard quality, which... You know, you just hack it together. It's who fine. Cares? They're just putting on a cell phone that's going to millions of pockets. It who only cares? costs $800. Who cares, right? And so uh, that should be landing in its early quality status in the 5.4 kernel, XFAT like that. I'd love to see that land in Fedora 31. And now, ha has there been time for quality improvements? Or is this still... No, no, no. Okay. I mean, maybe. You know, maybe. I mean, I, honestly, if I were them, I would, as soon as uh, Microsoft made that announcement, I would have been like, all right, get that guy back over here. Get him working on it. <clears throat> That's what I would have done. <laughs> I don't know. But you're right. I mean, it is, it's nice to see and... Uh, now we can now we can all use it. Finally, it's it's out there. Not that I needed a ton. But. I just had that experience during the. So what happened was is during our team sprint in the summer, we had a bunch of great pictures, and I'm like, well, let me pop in the old SD card here that's built into my ThinkPad. Right, it's great. Take advantage of that because hashtag port options, and uh, I pop it in there, and I look like a fool because my operating system, which was Fedora 30. Could do nothing with nothing. it. Nothing. And I had the realization that I, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta go install Fuse and I got this whole it, it, song and dance. It sounds silly, but it, it's almost like being pulled back to old Linux. You know, like these days things just mostly just yeah. work. Well, yeah. And this is suddenly like, oh right, Linux right. is like this sometimes. Yeah. And, and so it would be kind of a remarkable thing if in the next release, if in 31, it just worked. Even if it wasn't like, even if it was just read only, I'd be fine with that. Mm hmm. I don't, I don't, don't get me right. Just let me import my damn pictures, please. <laughs> I want to stash them in my file system like a squirrel. It is cool. I mean, like, right, open source. And now you know that if, if improvements are needed, we've got the kernel infrastructure and, yeah. and development staff in, yeah. in place. When I think this only helps the creatives that use Linux from day to day, like Brent, you know, uh, constantly pulling images from large SD cards or creating video content. Drone video, I mean, anything like that. Um, I think this is a win for us for sure. So tell us about Clip Grab. Cheesy brings us an app pick this week that could be useful for those of you that like offline media like I do. Ooh. So yeah, I was digging around actually in the uh, Manjaro repos uh, last night and I came across Clip Grab, which is essentially um, a GUI version, not necessarily a version of YouTube DL. Um, it's its own thing. But it, it's it's super nice. Um, I use it to pull down tutorial videos uh, for different Adobe products and stuff like that so that I can offline those and watch them separately on another device while I'm actually going through them. I love it, man. It, uh, clip grab. Check it out. It's, it's worth the download and uh, it's super easy to use, dead simple to use. Uh, you can pull down MP4, MP3, AUG, uh, all different various formats. 
Oh, this is just an app image. Hey, Andy. Yeah, it's an app image. And you can just download and run it. And uh, yeah, it can convert videos to MP3s if you want to like pop it on a podcast while you're driving and you don't need the visuals. That's pretty great. Thanks, Cheesy. I mean, there, there's so many options out there now for that kind of stuff. I don't know how YouTube feels about it, but it seems clear that there's a need and a demand for that kind Absolutely. of thing. Absolutely. You can find a link to that as well as everything else we've talked about and the news stories and all of that over at linuxunplugged.com slash 319. And Wes, did you know we do this here show live? Oh, yeah, every Tuesday. It's probably a good thing you knew that because if you didn't, we'd need to have a separate conversation. Uh, yeah, that's true. It'd be I mean, really I, awkward. <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird. How have my timing been so good all this time? <laughs> it's just lucky, I guess. Uh, go get more Wes over at techsnap.systems. Him and Jim Salter doing their thing over That's right. the TechSnap program. Loving that every single week. And do join us live. If you want to know when, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. You can also just follow us on uh, the Twitters. Oh, yeah. We tweet about it. Yeah. That's for sure. I'm at Chris Elias. I'm at Wes Payne. The network is at Jupiter Signal. So go check that out. Also, go check out our buddies' Ubuntu podcast. Go Ooh, check them out. Oh, yeah. Why not? Always cutting out a good uh, a good episode of those guys every single week. So go check them out and join us next time. LinuxUnplugged.com slash 319. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you right back here next Tuesday. It's a it's an episode of transitions. Think about this. No kidding. So we talk about Richard Stallman resigning. We talk about PowerShell on Linux. What? And Manjaro becoming a legitimate business and like the top tier Linux distributions shifting. Like this this episode really reflects a really kind of massive amount of change going on. And it's like part exciting and part somber because it's you know the 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 somber side. It's you know seeing somebody like Richard Stallman, who is so well known in our community, and the technical contributions he's made have been so important to. Mm. I mean, a passionate computers. free software advocate, and has shaped our discourse for a long time. Yeah, and uh, and then also yet un- undeniably a troublesome personality for a long time. That uh, there was going to be some kind of uh, reckoning, and it's just. To see that thing, to see all of that go down, while also seeing the nature and ba- basic use of free software and open source radically shifting with Microsoft and just the massive, massive deployment of cloud infrastructure and all of the people that are writing software for that. And and also at the same time, Manjaro becoming a company, to me, seems to be a clear indicator that there is still a market for desktop Linux. Like, I thought we were done with this. I thought we were all done with this. We'd had it. You know, everybody gave their shot. The people that could make it work had usually other commercial backings to them, like obvious reasons why they were in the market. Um, and then Manjaro like came along. It's like an unexpected little bright star in the Linux constellation. And it seems to validate the market a little bit. It's not It's not necessarily like a foregone conclusion. It's not, but it's a data point. It's a signal. Yeah. It's exciting to watch, too. I mean, it's not all that surprising, Chris. Uh, if you think about uh, projects with their own self-commercial backing, like elementary OS being a thing, and there's a number of other ones. Like, I mean, Endless is one of those that are closer to the failed state than a lot of other ones. But they're all almost every single desktop Linux distribution project that has existed has either pivoted some other way, or refocused, or even pivoted back, or something like that. It's the fact that desktop Linux still exists today after almost, what, 20 years of ragging and attempts and stuff like that, <laughs> I think kind of proves that there is some degree of staying power, but we probably just don't quite understand where the pieces fit just yet into right. making it like broadly successful. I think that's fair, yeah. Yeah, we'll keep trying. I mean, every everyone from Red Hat to Endless to 
uh, you know, Manaro and uh, all the rest of them. We'll all keep working at it and we'll see what happens. I, I think Manjaro too, the other thing that's fascinating about it is it's not uh, sold as super approachable for new Linux users out of the box, you know, get mom and dad started using a computer. Right. It's, it's um, a little bit more of a more sophisticated user's desktop. Right. Yeah. You're a Linux user. You want like a, you know, a, a good solid desktop machine that you can use without a bunch of limitations. Right. Even the concept of how it does its updates is more of an advanced user's right. concept than what people are used to when it comes to commercial operating systems. I have a bit of a theory here. And this is the rise of DevOps. This is the rise of people using Linux at work and then thinking, hmm, this is quite good on the server. Uh, why don't I give it a try on the desktop? What's the worst that could happen? Right. And there is there is some nice advantages to the desktop being rolling. Because if you want fresh user land applications. I do, I do. And you want fresh uh, whatever. Like for me, it would be Gnome Shell if I was a Gnome Shell user. You're such a, such want the a latest, sucker for that. Got to get the latest XFC every four years. <laughs> uh, you know, there's some advantages. Really what it is, is about getting fresh Chrome and fresh Firefox and new Thunderbird and getting all of these applications that are just in a repository automatically updated. That's a, When you come from Windows or Mac OS, that's <laughs> yeah, a right. luxury. It's a, it's a yearly thing where you got to upgrade your operating system on Mac OS. They do that every year. Oh, you mean <laughs> that's it crazy. works just like the Play Store? Yeah, right. Uh, so the the advantages of rolling for uh, for you know somebody who's just using it as a workstation, as long as in, as long as it doesn't break anything, are pretty appealing. Right. They're hand holding in the right places. Aren't you, Mister Fedora, that wants to upgrade every nine months? I think I think Fedora is a better cadence because you still get fresh applications, but it's not it's not like rolling constantly. So I, and that to me is just a little bit slower, and that's just a, the preference I like. But I can totally appreciate the appeal for the desktop still. I, I kind of miss it sometimes. So and the other thing on the flip side of this with the, with the pure rolling environment, um, then the, the, the major difficulty that you'll, you'll start having is, you know, how do you make sure everything stays working more or less forever? Yeah. One of the reasons why most distributions have a cadence is so that they can have a choke point or a break point right. in which they can make changes. Like my experience with working in OpenSUSE Tumbleweed and other rolling distributions is that it gets extremely hard to make major changes without breaking people unless you have those kinds of uh, release points. Um, and so one of the challenges I, I'm watching out for to see how Manjaro handles it is that how are they going to handle when they need to make a major change and then they have to make sure that that works and it upgrades and it handles cleanly. And as they grow as a business, because that's what they're going to do, there's going to be people filing bug reports expecting some kind of assistance or help or fixes or things like that. It, you get into an interesting mess that you don't typically have as a community project that doesn't have a commercial sponsor. Um, I don't know how they're going to handle this, and I'm kind of playing the wait and see to see how this will how this will shake out. So the, one of the reasons we don't really see Rolling do this is because this is really, really hard to do right in, a, in that commercial-ish context, even for home users, especially for home users who don't necessarily have that same level of um, patience that uh, maybe enterprise users can be pushed back into. Right. I also feel that uh, when when people pay money, they feel like entitled. And then if a rolling release breaks after they paid for it in some way, shape, or form, then it's the backlash is going to be much bigger. Well, maybe that's a maybe that's a market opportunity to sell us a service support contract. I mean, maybe it kind of depends on if how they set the expectation. I think it's it's fascinating because um, it's not your typical distro to go for this kind of thing. Clearly, there's a community behind it. And also of note, we're talking a lot about Workstation, but a big part of the community there is clearly gaming, too. That's that's what's got so much attention on YouTube. Right. It's, uh, so it's something to watch. Like I say, it's uh, the end of summer is always interesting in open source land. <laughs> 